uh, I'm here uh, speaking to a, a packed house at uh, Fellowship Baptist Church tonight. i uh, just like to uh, remind everyone here uh, in the auditorium to please obey the social distancing rules. Uh, I know it's going to be hard uh, with as many people as we have in here. Um, if you're online, uh, welcome, and uh, I hope you enjoy the study that we're going to do tonight. We're in the second week uh, of our three-week series on Jesus as philosopher. Um, just to recap uh, what we did last week, uh, we talked a little bit uh, about, uh, I showed some, some artwork from a place called Dura Europa. Uh, it's a, a, a fortress, a little fortress town in Syria uh, that is remarkably well preserved uh, and it has a bunch of frescoes in its synagogue, which has been abandoned for about 2,000 years. Uh, of Moses and Samuel and Ezra the prophet uh, as philosophers. They're dressed in a uniform. Uh, it's a white toga with blue, uh, like blue piping. Um, and then I showed a, a picture um, from the little house church that was right down the street from it, depicting Jesus in the same outfit. So Jesus, uh, they thought of him as a philosopher. We talked a little bit uh, about what that meant in the ancient world. Um, today, uh, when I say, uh, when somebody identifies themselves as a philosopher, we kind of tend to think of them as probably an academic, right? Somebody who maybe teaches philosophy at a university, because that's all philosophy is really good for, uh, is to debate these uh, sort of esoteric or, or weird questions. That's kind of how we think of it. As I was reflecting this week, it occurred to me that there's another place where philosophy resides um, in our, our current cultural landscape, and that is in self-help books. Um, we might not think of um, philosophy as uh, super important to our culture, but if you go to a bookstore, um, some of the, the best-selling books of the last 10, 20 years uh, have been about how to make yourself a better person, right? Um, seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, how to win friends and influence people, the power of now, the power of positive thinking, uh, 12 Rules for Life, which is a book by Jordan Peterson, a Canadian philosopher that came out a few years ago. Um, how to Stop Worrying and Start Living, which I wrote down as uh, How to Stop Living and Start Worrying, which is probably, probably not good. Um, so uh, we have kind of compartmentalized the idea of philosophy into this um, it, kind of a, a, a self-help regimen. Uh, more importantly, uh, we have uh, taken the philosopher out of Jesus. Uh, when we uh, think of him, we don't think of him always as giving like a whole life philosophy, like an idea of how to live. And instead, we focus very much on uh, his... Uh, work, his ministry, and his work, and his redemptive power on the cross, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, which, you know, obviously uh, the, the most important aspect of who and what he was. Um, but uh, to the, those ancient people, uh, right, to the first Christians, uh, that wasn't all he was. He was a person who was articulating a whole life philosophy. Um, we think of, and this is really a, a, a connection to how we think of, of religion, right? Or how we think of our, our, um, our walk with Christ. Uh, we tend to, uh, like a, I'll, I'll use the analogy of a chest of drawers, um, which I'm sure everybody has in their house somewhere, right? A dresser or a chest of drawers with different, different compartments in it. Um, I have uh, in my, my house, um, so I used to do a lot of running, uh, and I have a drawer um, where there's just running socks uh, and like equipment, like there's a headlamp in there for if I was running early in the morning or late at night. Um, there's, uh, there are gloves, right, to, if it was cold outside. So just like running gear uh, that I would have. Um, and then I have another drawer in the chest of drawers that has uh, slacks, pants. I guess slacks are for women. I, I, don't wear, I don't wear women's pants. I wear regular pants. Sorry. Um, 
I'm going to tell you that I have a, a drawer for blouses, too. I, I don't. That's for shirts. Uh, then I have a, sh a shirt, a uh, drawer for t-shirts, and I have a drawer for, you know, whatever. Um, if you, uh, and I always put away my own clothes, right, uh, usually, because what I don't want is to open up the drawer that has my regular socks in it and find my running socks in it, uh, or to find a shirt in the same drawer that I, that's where I put my pants, right? Um, we kind of have that idea uh, of our, our Christian walk, right? Like, um, it's a compartment in our lives where we kind of stow, that, that's, we put all the Jesus stuff in this drawer, and then we, we uh, shut the drawer, and we're going to get it out when we, go, when we go to church, or when we're dealing with church people. Um, and then we have our politics, and that's in another drawer. And we have our work life, and that's in another drawer. Um, and we keep them very separate, very regimented, very um, uh, oh, kind of not close to one another. Uh, it's easy to be a different person uh, at work uh, than, than it is uh, a different person at work than you are at church for modern people, right? Because we have that kind of compartmentalization uh, in, in the way that we think of things. Um, that's not... That's not how Jesus intended his teachings to take a hold of us and guide our lives. Um, the way he thought about it and the way he communicated it was um, this philosophy, this idea about the kingdom of heaven that I'm presenting to you is supposed to be, in a, it's supposed to infect every part of what you do. It's supposed to touch on everything that you are, everything that you think about, every, every action that you take um, is supposed to be done in light of the coming kingdom. Um, and your role in it, right? Um, so I, I, I guess that, that's kind of setting the stage for what we're going to talk about next. Uh, we are going to get to, in a moment, um, I want to talk, that, so in order to be a whole life philosophy, so uh, somebody like Aristotle or Socrates or one of the Greek uh, philosophers that the, the New Testament authors are clearly interacting with, they would have only thought of a philosophy as being uh, whole life, as affecting everything, uh, or as being a valid philosophy at all, uh, if it included four, four characteristics. One of them is a, a theory or an idea of how things came to be the way that they are. Uh, so uh, we can think of that as physics and metaphysics. Um, Physics is the things that you can see, and metaphysics is the things that you can't. It's the, the big questions that lie behind the things that you can see. Uh, and you go back and you read somebody like Aristotle, and he had like wild ideas about physics, right? About the things that you can see. He said, you, you know, everything is made up of earth, air, water, and fire. Everything, like that, that, those are the four elements, and everything's made up of those. Well, we know that's not true, right? Um, because things are made up of like iron and calcium and silicon and all kinds of different, you know, we, we, we have progressed beyond that, that physic, that, that theory of physics. Um, but metaphysics is the big, is, it asks the big questions. Why are things the way they are? Who made this? Um, what is it all for? Where's it going? Second is a theory of knowing. Um, like what, how do people know things and what is it important to know? Third is ethics. How are we to behave? Uh, what, what is it like to be a good person? What do we have to do? Uh, and then finally, politics. Uh, not what do you have to do as, a per, as an individual, but how do we form communities that are meaningful um, and are aimed at the good? Um, so we're going to talk about all those in turn. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, like physics and metaphysics and knowing today, um, along with some other topics. Uh, and then next week we'll talk about, we'll finish out by talking about kind of the big hitters, which is, well, okay, in light of all that we know, how are we supposed to act? Well, what's the, what's the general rule that Jesus would give us uh, if we asked him in any given situation, what should I do here? Um, and if we asked him, okay, uh, as a, a community, right, as a, 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 what the Greeks would have called a politeia, uh, a, a group of people aimed at a, at a single purpose, what would you have us do? How, how are we to act? Um, 
and so we're going to cover those next week. Uh, but this week, I want to I want to focus on uh, the, the on knowing and being. Uh, and the Bible actually has a lot to say about both of those. Um, one of the questions that you're probably asking yourself is, uh, okay, well, these early Christians they uh, had this desire to to depict Jesus as a philosopher. So, okay, that, that but. The people in Duro Europa that did this, that they lived like 200 years after Jesus was around. So is there anything in the Bible itself that teaches us uh, about Jesus as a philosopher? And there actually is quite a bit. Um, I, I want to just run through this really quickly, but I think it's an important point. It wasn't just early Christians who, who knew or saw this idea of him as a philosopher. It was the writers of the Gospels themselves and Jesus himself presented himself as a philosopher. Um, one, just the, the nature of the Gospels. Um, there was a genre of writing called bios. It's, we call it biography. Um, but bios, uh, bioses, bios were written uh, about philosophers primarily. Um, and it would be a story about that person's life, an explanation of their teaching, um, and then a description of what happened to them. Uh, and it was written down for a few different reasons. One is to, to tell you about that, to preserve information about them. The other is to convince you to become a disciple of that person, to, to kind of buy into their life philosophy and uh, study and expand on what they, they said and then, and then to follow them, right? To follow the, 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 the uh, way of um, living and thinking that they are, are kind of bringing forward uh, and there are a few famous ones. Uh, uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor, is a, an example of a bios. Um, it, it's actually really good. He was an interesting guy. Uh, he practiced a philosophy called Stoicism. Uh, it's about separating yourself from emotion. Uh, and uh, his first chapter of that Meditations is about people that he knew and learned from. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. He had a brother uh, who, is, who was an alcoholic uh, in modern terms uh, named Lucius Verus. And the first line in Meditations is, this is written to Lucius Verus who taught me what not to do. Uh, right? So you can learn even from people who, who uh, may, maybe don't do the things that you want that you think are laudable or praiseworthy. In any event, it's a genre of writing very clearly modeled in, in the Gospels. Um, second is the use of aphorisms or short phrases, right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's an aphorism. Proverbs, right? Like short, short sayings that express the wisdom of the teacher. Um, and there are a bunch of these uh, in, in both the Old and New Testament. But with, with specific reference to Jesus, we can look at like Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, Josiah and, and uh, Christian, I, I did not give these to Richard, so you're not going to be able to display them for the people at home, I think. Um, but in any event, if we go to Matthew 6, 19 through 20, we find... i got to get uh, reading glasses. I'm old now. Uh, he says, Lay not up your treasures... Uh, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves, yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, uh, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? It's a, a very short saying that encapsulates something about the teacher's philosophy. Another great example, uh, Matthew fifteen eleven. We go there. We'll find that he says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Right? The idea being, um, these dietary laws, they, they, are, um, they were meaningful under the law, right? Like taking in, uh, like, you guys are all worried, he's saying to the Pharisees, about what you put in your body and that that's going to make you uh, corrupt. But I'm telling you that what's coming out of your mouth is the real corruption. That's the real problem. And then finally, Matthew 20, 16. And these are all just examples of, of short, pithy sayings of, of uh, Christ. Uh, 
that would have been very, very much at home uh, in the mouth of any philosopher. He says, so the last shall be first and the first last. For many, for many be called, but few chosen. Right? The idea being uh, this life, right? this idea of the kingdom of heaven is, is not for everyone. Um, second, so that, that use of aphorisms is, is, pretty, um, uh, is pretty common in the Gospels and is a, a mark that uh, Jesus was presenting himself as a philosopher. Third, the use of parables. Um, anybody ever read the, the, the uh, tortoise and the hare? The fable of the tortoise and the hare, right? The, the point of that is that slow and steady wins the race and being flashy doesn't pay off, right? But that's a, fa that's a, a fable or a parable uh, that Aristotle wrote, or that Aesop wrote and Aristotle reported and adopted. Um, and, right, the, the gospels are just replete with Jesus talking in parables and illustrating things in parables. Uh, it happens, it was his favorite teaching method. It happens over and over and over again. Argumentation, uh, the, the idea of confronting somebody with an opposing viewpoint, uh, reacting uh, to their question or comment or concern, uh, and then explaining your philosophy is another technique that was frequently used. If we go to Matthew 12, one through 14, At that time, Jesus uh, went on the Sabbath day through the, through the corn, and his disciples uh, were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Uh, right, because you're not supposed to work um, on, on, if, under the Jewish law. Uh, it, you're actually, you're not even supposed to walk more than a certain, uh, certain distance because that's, that's work. Um, and you can't work on the Sabbath day, but you're especially not allowed to glean or um, create a fire. Um, there are a whole bunch of rules related to what you can and can't do. Uh, and so the, these Pharisees see him, see his disciples uh, picking uh, uh, grain and eating it. Uh, it's not actually corn, uh, like uh, in the way that we use it. But it says, uh, but he said unto them, have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered, and they, were, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known uh, what this meaneth, I will have mercy." and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So he, he, right, he takes their, their question or their concern and he uses it to explain his philosophy, which is that what underlies the law is, um, is, is necessity and concern. Right? He, he's saying it's, it's better to do something good uh, and, and break this, this ceremonial law than to allow good stuff to go undone. If, if you injure yourself uh, in this city um, and you, um, you are, need to be hospitalized and it's on a Saturday, uh, you, you will be taken uh, maybe to Mount Carmel East or some other ho hospital. And it's, it's quite possible that a very nice Jewish doctor will, will, will fix you, right? Um, and that's because he's, and he's disobeying the ceremonial law, uh, but he's, he's obeying the law of necessity. He's, he's fixing you because it's a good thing to do, a mitzvah. And that's what Jesus is referring to. And then he makes a claim about himself, right? He's like, don't tell me what to do on the Sabbath or what my, what my followers should do on the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, uh, which probably made their hair stand on end. Right, so he combines this argumentation with a, a, a claim about who he is. So, and then I, I so that, that's all I, I'm just, all I'm doing with this, this uh, section here is just pointing out that, that it's not just a later invention that Christ is a philosopher. It's, it's a present and active thing in his life and in the, the writings of the people who uh, came to, to summarize his life, right? The gospel writers believed that he was a philosopher in addition to everything that he was and that he articulated a whole life philosophy. Um,
we make him, I think, too small uh, when we consign him to the cosmic realm, when we say, oh, he's, he's the Lord of the universe and the risen Savior. Right? That's true, and it's, it, it's the core of our faith, right? It, if you don't believe that he was the Son of God uh, and that he died on the cross, was buried and rose again on the third day, right? That's, that's a core tenet of our faith. It's what we believe. Right? Paul said, um, if he is not risen, then we are of all men most miserable, right? Because we, be- because we believe a lie. But, um, it, and it's strange to say that that makes him too small. Uh, but those early Christians, they believed um, in what he said about how they ought to live with a passion that exceeded their fear of death. Think about that. Um, I I, I bet if I, I'm not going to ask, but I bet if I asked, would you die for your belief in Jesus? Um, There'd be some hands that would go up, um, but if it came to it, boy, I bet there wouldn't be many takers, right? It's hard to think of martyrdom now, uh, sitting here in our, our uh, packed, uh, air, uh, heated auditorium uh, in, in this church in, in 20th, 21st century America, it's, it's hard to think about a time when people died for believing the words that are in this book, but they did. Uh, and it's because they believed that he came not just to give them uh, you know, pie in the sky when they die, uh, it's because they, they believed he came to teach a better way to live, right? It's, it, they believed that with a passion that consumed them. Uh, so uh, the words that he gave them made sense of the whole picture of life and creation, um, from how we got here to why we're here, uh, to what you should do, uh, to how your government should be run. Um, he, had a, he had an answer for every question, and, and that was what made them disciples. Uh, you know, we have this idea that, that belief in Christ is just a decision. Uh, it's an inflection point in your life, and suddenly you're a Christian, um, and you can kind of go off and do whatever you want, uh, and come back you know, 20, 30 years later, and it's fine. Uh, but that's never how it was meant to be. That's never how Christ intended it. He intended us to follow a philosophy uh, that he articulated. So let's go ahead and dive into those four categories that I talked about uh, earlier, this idea of physics and metaphysics. And you say, well, what's the Bible have to do with uh, the natural world? Like how the natural world is ordered and constituted. Um, And it's true. The Bible's not a book of science, right? It doesn't, um, doesn't tell us uh, how atoms come together to form matter or uh, how energy works or any of a thousand other things that we find interesting. But it does have this to say. If we turn to First John, or to, turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Um, actually, no, let's not do that. Let's turn to Genesis 1.1. You all know what's coming. I should really uh, get some reading glasses. Getting old's no fun. I've not found it to be fun. I'm sure there's there's a fun part of it somewhere, but um, okay. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the day. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And I won't go on, right? This is the creation account. We all know it. Uh, We've all read it a thousand times. Um, But it makes a claim, right, about how the world that we can see was formed. It was created by a personal God who uh, was present, right? He, it says his spirit hovered above the face of the water. 
Uh, it says uh, he spoke it into existence. Um, and it says later on that he saw that it was good. He made a value judgment about it. So we know that about God from this, right? And about creation, that he made it good in his own eyes. Um, so, right, that, that's the beginning of a truth claim about physics and metaphysics, about what, how the world came to be. Second, uh, let's, go, let's go to chapter 3. Why is the world like it is? <laughs> it's a question, right? If it was all good, um, how, come it's, how come it's not good now? How come it's less good? Well, in chapter 3, we find this description. Uh, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had, had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, and of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch, touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye, sh and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And, the, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Keep that in your mind when we talk about knowing. Um, right, so, so th there's a truth claim here about why the world is the way it is. Why is the world messed up or less perfect than it could be? And the answer is disobedience. Um, and, you know, we could talk about whether this is a depiction of an actual event or a, a metaphor or whatever, um, and some people do. Um, but the fact is, it's making a claim, right, about why the world, it's a, it's a metaphysical claim. What, what, is, what is underneath that is causing the world to be the way it is? And we find that it's disobedience, right? It's, it's that people, people did what God said not to do uh, and said to him, we get to decide what's right and wrong, and you don't. Or you, I mean, our, our judgment about what is good and what is bad is as valid as yours, right? Um, so let's turn to uh, John 1. And I'm sorry I'm skipping around so much, but I think this is important. Um, I'm trying to demonstrate that there's a whole life philosophy uh, contained in the Bible, and it's actually pretty easy. Um, if we go to John 1, you're going to see that John starts out with a version of what we just read uh, in Genesis 1, but he adds something, um, and it's, it's pretty profound. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name... Oh, I won't go on. Uh, maybe I will. Yeah, I will. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God." even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is a, a description, right? It's, a, it's a, an echo of what we read in Genesis 1. And it's also a truth claim, right? He's saying, the, the world, he's saying, the logos, right, that, that's the Greek word for word, 
right? The, the idea or identity that's described here as the word uh, is logos. Um, and it's, it's not uh, only in Christianity that it exists. Um, it's a Greek philosophical concept. Uh, if you had asked a Greek who was a Stoic or an Epicurean or followed some, an, an Aristotelian who had followed some other kind of, of philosophy, um, and you had said, you had said well, what's, what's the logos? They would have answered very much. They would have said, well, it's, it's the means by which the universe was created. It's the central kind of organizing principle of the whole world, and it ties everything together right? It, that, that's what they would have said. Um, John is, um, he's challenging that Greek idea at the same time that he challenges Jewish ideas about um, how, how Messiah will come, right? No Jew ever expected that God would become incarnate in the form of a person, ever. Right? That, that wasn't part of their, their, um, their thought process. We're told in 1 Corinthians 6 that, um, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, that uh, all, of the script, all the mysteries of God, the, the, the way that this, the Old Testament hung together to predict Jesus uh, was a mystery. Uh, that because if, if the... the rulers of this world, right, the, the spiritual, the evil spiritual powers that, that drive the world had known who he was, they would, not have, they would not have slain him. They wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, it says. So he's challenging these ideas about, uh, that come from, from Judaism, right? He's saying the, the logos, the, the organizing principle of the universe, God came down and was flesh, Right? There's some component of this logos that was present with God at the beginning. It's what God was made out of, and God used it to create the universe. And then he's saying to Greeks, you think the logos is this abstract idea about how the universe, but I'm telling you, it's a person. And that person came to earth, and I knew him, and I met him, and I I. I witnessed alongside him and I saw him crucified and I saw him rise again the third day and he came into the world and no one believed him right it, it's it's this challenge right it's a truth claim about how the world was made and how it continues to exist and why it is the way it is let's turn really quickly um, I think I'm running out of time to Colossians which I won't be able to find in my Bible because I didn't mark it, and my eyes are the eyes of a 400-year-old person. But I'm going to do my best here. Yikes. Are you kidding me? Ah, got it. Believe me when I tell you that there is nothing more embarrassing than getting up here and not knowing where the scripture is. It's, I, I've, I've been embarrassed before up here, but that's the most embarrassing when you cast about in front of an audience of thousands, as there are here tonight. All right, uh, first, uh, Colossians 1, chapter 15, or Colossians 1, verse 15. Uh, and he's talking about Christ. He says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the, through, the blood of, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Think of how big that claim is, right? He's saying, 
saying, Jesus, as the word, right, God used him or was present with him and they created the world. And then he says, not only that, but by him, by his present action, right now, he sustains creation. If he stopped, it would wink out like a light. Right? By him, all things consist. Right? It's, it's a claim about how the universe operates. Right? Uh, Christ was there at the beginning, and this, this man, Jesus, who was incarnated, powers creation to this very day is the claim that Paul is making in, in, this, in these verses. And then he says, uh, remember chapter 3? Remember how things were broken? Right? Well, it also pleased God to make Christ the vehicle for the reconciliation of people with himself. Um, I'm going to stop here in just a minute, but let, let me make one more point about this. Um, and we'll talk about knowing very briefly next week before we get into ethics um, and, and politics, because I think both of those are, are sort of flow together. N notice the kind of story that the Bible is telling, right? And, and it, this is also a, a metaphysical claim. If I gave you, uh, I don't know, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a, a Hindu text, and you read it um, and didn't fall asleep, but say you read it, um, it's actually kind of interesting, but uh, if you read it, you would see that, that the metaphysic it teaches is that uh, life is a wheel, right? That all of existence and time is a wheel, and uh, right, that's where the idea of reincarnation comes from. It just things happen over and over and over again in patterns and cycles, and maybe you learn and maybe you don't, but eh, you know, basically everything repeats over and over and over again. When you read the Bible, and that's very common in many cultures, that idea of repetition. When you read the Bible, you get a very different view of the universe, right? It's headed towards a goal. We talked about this last week a little bit, how Christ taught that in the future, right, there's this kingdom that's coming. It's both out of time and beyond death, and it's a place where everything gets made right. Um, and that kingdom exists in the now as well, and you're a citizen of it, and you need to act in accordance with, as if it existed already, right? And, and bring it forward in time. Uh, yeah, bring it backwards in time. Um, right, he taught that, but notice what's implied, right? History is headed towards something. It's now and it's not yet, but time is linear, right? Th this is important because it, it means that things aren't like they are, or things aren't like they should be, but one day they will be, right? We're not stuck on a wheel, right? It's, it's not an endless repetition that we're doomed as people to repeat the mistakes of the past, right? It, it's a metaphysic, like woven into the grain of the universe, is the idea that there is perfection waiting for us at the end of it. So, in any event, I, I hope that was helpful. I know that um, this is kind of a, a strange topic to teach, but I, I think it's important for us to understand Christ's posture as a philosopher and what it means for us. Because I think once we discover that, we can, we can think about how to live and how to take him out of, out of the, the chest of drawers and and really integrate uh, our faith into everything that we do. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and leave off. Let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, thank you so much, God, for um, allowing us uh, to learn from your word. Thank you for preserving your word for us, God, across time. Um, we thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us a whole life philosophy that we can look to and think about God as, as we go through our day ask that you'll help us all to come back safely next week, Lord, that you'll um, just be with us, help us to, to uh, think about you, um, think about you know, the principles that you taught, and think about how to be a, a, an agent of the kingdom of heaven, even in the present day. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.